Hello, Facebook Live. I have the great honor today of sitting with my teacher, Swami Shankar Ananda, here in his study uh, to ask him a couple of questions and answers. And uh, during this time, you'll have the opportunity to write in questions that you might have for Swamiji. And hopefully, uh, you know, we have some questions prepared where we'd like to talk about the coronavirus. Uh, and at the end, if there's time, we hope to get to your questions. So if there are uh, burning questions that you have to ask Swamiji, we hope that you'll write them in the comments below. And if we can't get to them this time, well, we hope to get to them in future installments of this time here in Swamiji's study. So welcome, Swamiji. Thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. Good pleasure, Nataraj. Nice to see you. It's so nice to be here. Yeah. So recently, you've been saying that these are extraordinary times that we're living in. And I want to know if you have any reflections on the spiritual implications of what our new normal is, being uh, this time of the coronavirus. Well, it's like nothing that we've ever experienced in our lifetime. The only uh, analogy to it would be to be in a state of war, which I've been fortunate enough not to have been living in the U.S. Um, so it's an extraordinary time. Uh, my attitude towards it is like with all experience, uh, deal with it. <clears throat> That's what they say in New York anyway, deal with it. That's what you got, deal with it. It means whatever arises in your life and consciousness, you have to assimilate in some way and remain in the state of the self and try to keep in the state of the self. So this is a big one. This is um, extraordinarily difficult, painful. Uh, it's affected our lives in ways we couldn't possibly anticipate. Uh, here we are cooped up in the ashram here. No one comes in, no one goes out. <clears throat> Just a few weeks ago, it used to be a place where people flowed in and out and we had public programs. Now there are no uh, programs for the public and the ashramites live here and don't leave. So in every way, it's a, uh, and then there's a lot of suffering and uh, pain all around the world. Uh, so, but we have to deal with it spiritually. It's not a great idea to say, why is this happening? I mean, you can do it, but it's kind of a, a, a you know, mental masturbation, as it were, just to think about why. It's, it's just what we have to do is deal with it. And then when faced with uh, incredible suffering or circumstances out of our control, what would you say is the best attitude for us to hold as practitioners? I'm a great uh, devotee of uh, the uh, Stoics, the ancient Stoics in the Western tradition, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. And what Epictetus said was that there are two sorts of things, those which are in your control and those which are out of your control. And for things that are in your control, you should work very hard and you know be proactive in that realm. For example, can you wash your hands? Yes, you can wash your hands. Can you uh, keep a social distance or whatever? Uh, can you follow the guidelines of, of the health professionals? You can do that. Can you uh, ensure that nothing bad is going to happen in the future? You can't do that. So Epictetus said, whatever you can control, work hard to do the best you can. What you can't control, what's out of your control, let it go. And I would add to that, that, that you have to surrender to the higher power. You surrender to God, to the Guru, to the Shakti. And you say, and you can pray. That's one thing. You can put in a word and say, please make this go away or protect my loved ones or protect the world or make people not suffer. You can do that. Then you have to let it go. Turn it over, as they say. Mm -hmm. Now that you've brought, now that you've brought the G word into the, into the room, I want to know where do you think <laughs> God is in the time of COVID-19? Well, <laughs> um, well, God is uh, always here and always, um, you know, Shaivism teaches that uh, Shiva or universal consciousness underlies this whole creation. Mm -hmm. In other words, all of this is a manifestation of God, from God and in God. So there's no nothing separate from God. The only thing that's separate from God is us when we think we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, the human being is this is the uh, mechanism for separating from God by wrong thinking. So God is always there. Can we understand why this happens? No, we can't understand why God created famine and war and pestilence and Hitler and uh, 
you know, all kinds of things. Why the Yankees lose, all these things. How can you explain that? I think a lot of people at home are are feeling very separate. And yeah. what would you suggest for people who do feel that sense of separateness or restlessness, people who are bored and anxious at home? How, how do you recommend that they could overcome that? And are there any practices that you think are indispensable for that condition and this time? Well, it's always good to, to try to flow in harmony with reality. And so obviously you can't, there's a lot of things you can't do that you were doing only a month ago. Mm. Uh, and if you're a sports addict, there's no sport on TV. And if you just want to party and socialize, you can't do that. You can't even go to a concert, nothing. Uh, but, but there are things you can do, and those are the things you should do. And obviously it's a very good time for spiritual practice and turning within because uh, no virus can take the self away from you. No virus can take meditation away from you. Uh, and it's a good time because it's very crucial in this time uh, to control your emotions about it and not to be lost. There's a, a, a pervasive fear that's around the whole world. The whole world is in a state of fear. And it's easy to get caught up in that. And so we have to maintain our equilibrium here. And to do that, spiritual practice is very much um, to the point. So I would say that people should do a little bit more. Uh, if you meditate 15 minutes a day, meditate 30 minutes a day. Uh, repeat the mantra. Repeating the mantra uh, is a very, very good method for quieting the mind and staying centered. In our tradition, the mantra we give is Om Namah Shivaya. I bow to the self. I bow to Shiva, that universal consciousness within. So uh, it's a great time for spiritual practice. Mm. <clears throat> and at the heart of uh, this lineage is Kashmir Shaivism, which you've written extensively about. Yeah. Um, why do you think that Kashmir Shaivism or Tantra in general is a relevant path for modern times? Well, getting away from the virus for a minute. Yeah. Oh, well, let me say one more thing about about the virus. And uh, uh, in the early 70s, I went to India. I was a very hungry young seeker. Mm. Uh, I was looking for a guru and a, a place to do sadhana, spiritual practice. And I got to Baba Muktananda's ashram in Ganeshpuri, outside of Mumbai. Uh, and it was out in the country. There wasn't anything you could do. You couldn't go clubbing or anything like that. <laughs> Most you could do is go next door and have a cup of chai. Um, and so we were, we were isolated there and we did spiritual practice from 3.30 in the morning till we tumbled into bed, chanting, meditation, work in the ashram, and so on. Uh, and that's all we did. <clears throat> when, I was, when, when I came to the West and I founded ashrams, uh, I started an ashram in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I uh, later ran ashrams in uh, New York City and in L.A. and here in Melbourne. And all of these ashrams were uh, sort of um, in the middle of life. They were urban. Uh, the people, the ashramites were not isolated. They usually worked outside mm -hmm. and did practice in the evening or early mornings. And so I always thought, this is a different circumstance. Now what's happened with our isolation is we've recapitulated the Ganeshpur experience. So, so it's very much like the Ganeshpur experience here inside the ashram. Although alas, all the devotees who come can't come now, so they, uh, but we have the internet to, to reach them. So that's interesting, uh, sort of, um, what do they call it? A, a collateral damage of, of this. It's, uh, we feel, it's feeling a lot like Ganeshpur used to in some ways. Um, now, what did you ask about Kashmir Shaivism? Well, when I was with Baba, he introduced me to Kashmir Shaivism. I had studied some Vedanta. I had studied the works of Ramana Maharshi. Um, and um, it always struck me. I was it very appealing to me, but it struck me how life-denying it is in a sense. Mm. Uh, that, it, that Vedanta says this world is an illusion and we, and underneath that, this world's illusion is also, this world's rather loathsome and, you know, ignore it. And none, none, it's not real. And, it, and 
and it's a bit annoying too, not only unreal, but annoying and painful and dangerous. Uh, and here was Shaivism, which said, it, it agreed with Vedanta that consciousness is the underlying factor, not matter. But it said this world is real, it's the play of consciousness. And I thought that's so positive. And that Westerners who have a hard time with denying the world, we're very much, those Westerners are very much involved with the world. And we value it. And we've conquered it in a lot of ways, except we haven't conquered this virus, have we? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but you know, there's another thing, is that the thing, the most powerful force in the universe is also the fundamental force in the universe, mm. and that is consciousness. God is consciousness, and we participate in, we are conscious beings. And when consciousness is focused on anything, it works that out, it solves that problem. And I've never seen so much concentration. Talk about focus, talk about meditation. There's samyama on this virus and all the best minds in the medical profession, the scientific profession are focusing on it in an extraordinary way. I mean, some of it's neurotic and just like terror, but others very productively. And I think that we'll have breakthroughs on this mm. uh, because Consciousness is the most divine attribute. <clears throat> so. We just got a great uh, written-in question from okay. one of the viewers. Okay. Narada writes, how do you deal with chronic or ongoing physical pain, not the flu or the coronavirus? Physical pain is uh, very difficult. It's very difficult. And it's a, it's a cross to bear. Um, there are a lot of things in our karma that are uncomfortable. Um, and I have great... Uh, fellow feeling, compassion for anybody in physical pain. I've had my own share of physical pain. You just have to uh, deal with it. <laughs> you have to live with it and uh, do the mantra. And I would go and get and consult with the best health professionals and do the best you can for it. I'm not against painkillers or anything like that. Uh, but you have to, um, in yoga, you there's a, a quality uh, of being uh, keeping your equanimity uh, in the among the when the pairs of opposites mm. pain and pleasure hot and cold and, and so on and to keep your equanimity there and that's a very strong uh, very important thing to be able to cultivate so if you can't get rid of that pain then you have to live with it and find a way psychologically to bear it mm. uh, the more we can bear, uh, we have to become like the earth, which bears everything. The earth, on the earth walks Jesus, on the earth walks Hitler, and the earth just bears it. And so we have to become like that. Uh, nobody said it's easy. These things are very difficult and profound. Mm. In response to like circumstances out of our control, you know, we've had to move all of the ashrams programming online, which we... You know, normally the ashram, its <laughs> weekly schedule was very much in, in personal contact. It was about being in close proximity uh, with you and the Shakti that's here at the mm -hmm. ashram. Yeah. And you met with those uh, kind of immovable forces or circumstances. Do you have any experiences that you'd like to share from having to adapt or work around <laughs> the circumstances at play right now? Well, I'm used to speaking to a, a live audience. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and now... I realized that the audience is in radio land. <laughs> I know that dates me, but that's how I think of it. Because when I grew up, I was in the radio era. And so all of you out in, in radio land, and yet mystically, because consciousness is not limited by body and by physical, you can still feel the energy of, of all that uh, focus. So I still can feel your presence there out in radio land. Though I can't see your smiling and beautiful faces. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's an adjustment, but it it comes down to the same thing because God is everywhere and consciousness is everywhere. Mm. Uh, so, and you recently released a spiritual memoir about your time spent in uh, Swami Muktananda's ashram in Ganeshpuri, India, and you've already mentioned that there is a kind of um, close parallel between the kind of sadhana that we're doing day in and day out here at the ashram now and back then. Are there any other um, parallels or similar experiences that you'd like to share with us? 
Well, I, uh, you know, in writing that book, I, I've been wanting to write that book for a long time. Mm. And uh, the two things, one is I wanted to celebrate the process of sadhana or spiritual practice. And I had no knowledge of this when I was back, I was an academic uh, and uh, everything that we learned in the academy uh, was to increase our knowledge, but not necessarily f for personal growth or for personal happiness. When I discovered that there was such a thing as sadhana or spiritual practice, I was off to India. I was just so, so I wanted to write about the process of sadhana. When in Baba's ashram, there was a fierce discipline and he was a great guru. He was uh, illumined and loving and harsh and intense and it was everything you could want. Um, and it was just a beautiful process, not always pleasant. In fact, hardly ever pleasant, a lot of burning, <laughs> and, uh, but beautiful. And uh, so I wanted to celebrate that possibility because every person has the possibility to grow and to become all they can be, to realize the self within, realize their own consciousness and become happy and peaceful and, and fulfilled. And so I wanted to celebrate that. And I also wanted to celebrate the greatness of my guru and the greatness of the guru. Um, it, to me, uh, the decisive moment was when I found my guru. Yoga is very hard to practice without the guru, but with the guru, it becomes much easier. Not easy, I'll say, but, but much easier. So I wanted to celebrate the greatness of Baba Muktananda and the greatness of yoga and the greatness that lies within every person, the potential, the possibility lies within every person. At the heart of that growth, you teach is like following the Shakti, what you've kind of termed as following the upward shift. Yeah. And so someone wrote in a great question, Namdev okay. writes that some of his Buddhist friends have asked whether following this desire to grow or following the upward shift can lead to a kind of negative attachment to elevated states. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. <clears throat> That's interesting. I, I would draw a distinction mm -hmm. between uh, addiction to um, meditation experiences. We used to call it experience mongering. Uh, so if you know Baba Muktananda's writings, he wrote a spiritual autobiography called Play of Consciousness. And he had every possible vision and subtle uh, like astral travel. And he it's psychedelic, to, yeah. Uh, psych <laughs> psychedelic. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, of course, we uh, thought that was what we wanted. And uh, we were striving for that, to see the blue pearl and to ride the chariot to the heaven world, you know. <clears throat> and and that is not the point. That's that's addiction to states. Uh, however, Bhagwan Nityananda, Baba's guru, mm. used to say, and to summarize his teaching, Bhavana Rako, which means hold the feeling which means once you experience the self, that place of balance, of joy, of energy, energized uh, equilibrium within, hold that. That's not an addiction to a state, that's you. It's not a state, it's who you are. And so hold that. And when you go away from that, strive to get back to it. That's different. Now that's, that's Bhavana Rako. So don't become a, 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 a spiritual uh, experience monger. And you know how many times you saw Krishna dancing in blue light? That doesn't impress me. But if you can hold that space of love, joy, and equanimity, and intense uh, connection with the energy, the spiritual energy, which is a very real thing, and is we can all make contact with it, that's something else. So it's a, it's a distinction I've made. Yeah, Bhavana Rako. Oh, is no, it, it's its own complete sadhana, you know? <laughs> it's a complete sadhana, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you can, uh, you, it's optional whether you want to see Krishna dancing in blue light, which isn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> but after you've seen it once, then you pine for it. What good is that? Then you're in a state of pining. <laughs> also useful, pining. Uh, so many people are pining to be here, to be with you. <laughs> so. And I'm pining for all of you to come. So. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia writes in, how to keep equanimity with the demands from workplaces to use technologies that flow well, like now, and then they come to a screaming halt. 
Well, my screaming. What's that? So I think Patricia is asking about like how to maintain her 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 equanimity when um, her workplace is demanding that she uses she like there's an attachment that's coming now to using technology and how do you maintain your equanimity in a world that's so accelerated and then at the same time we're so dependent on this technology and at any moment it could all just go up in smoke. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the internet, uh, the uh, connection could break. And where would we be then? In the Stone Age. We'd have to sit with ourselves, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> when we were in Ganeshpuri, uh, uh, the electricity would go out right in the middle of a program. And they would run and they'd get these big lanterns that they put in there, you know. So, uh, yeah, we. Uh, one of the things about this virus is... Uh, how attached we are to normalcy, mm -hmm. how attached we are to uh, the uh, the endless uh, drone of normal events and normal experience, and it goes on and on. And suddenly, the rug is pulled out from under us, and we suddenly see what's real, what's not real, what's valuable, and what's not valuable. And we see that a lot of conventional reality is just sort of arbitrary. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering exactly that question no i think no i think you are in that okay. state of groundlessness there's an opportunity to take stock of who you really are right. and that's 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 right and i think patricia is wanting to know how do how do you keep your equanimity even when the shit hits the fan it's not do it keep your equanimity do do the best you can to keep your equanimity use every method that makes sense to you whether it's self-inquiry or the use of mantra, or just focusing on the self, mm -hmm. or the use of G statements, which are you know high spiritual ideas which connect you to that energy, to the impersonal. Uh, whatever whatever means, uh, uh, spiritual means are called upaya, which means method. So whatever method that you can work out. I used to do an experiment. Uh, with new meditators, when I'd have a class for the first time, I would say, just for, as an experiment, close your eyes and for, third, for one minute, stop your mind without giving them any previous instruction. And then we'd do it for a minute, they'd come out, and I'd say, uh, what did you do to do that? And they would invent all of yoga. Some would say a word, some would visualize a point, uh, some would watch their breath they, all spontaneously. They knew nothing. And in one minute, they invented all methods of yoga. So whatever means you have at hand, use that. Who was it? Archimedes said, I could move the world if I had a, a lever long enough, something like, something <laughs> like that. Uh, the thing is, use everything at your disposal to stay in a balanced state. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's yoga. And, um, when you lose it, don't beat yourself up. Go back to it. Bhavana Rako. Hold the feeling. When you lose it, go back to that feeling. Wonderful. Yeah. Swamiji, thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. I'm sure everyone who has watched has enjoyed uh, having your darshan. And um, if you've enjoyed the Q&A today, we hope that you'll join us online at Satsang Live, where you can watch um, our whole weekly schedule of programs, both streaming and on demand. And so if you're interested in that, it's available at www.satsanglive.com.au and we'll post a link in the comments. And um, thank you, very good questions. And also all of you in Radio Land, um, I'm pining for you. When are we going to be able to come here? <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you uh, stay well, do intelligent things I like to say, uh, with your left hand, wash your hands, or with your right hand, do the mantra. So keep both of those things in balance, the spiritual truth and the physical truth. Be intelligent and stay healthy, and hopefully we'll see you soon in another level of normal.